very much. It's a privilege to be here today. Um, as you may have noticed, a slightly different accent. I've just recently come over from Canada um, back in March, so not quite a year yet that I've been in Sydney, enjoying it, and um, very privileged to be at the University of New South Wales. When I first arrived, uh, my colleagues and I at uh, the University of New South Wales decided to explore a little bit around what sort of technology students um, are asking for and for their learning experiences, particularly in tertiary education. So I'll be speaking a little bit about that, um, about that particular study, that I, as well as some previous studies, and just some general information around technology usage um, for the particular uh, age group of 16 to 24. So there's lots of technologies out there that we know about. Um, it can actually be quite overwhelming sometimes as teachers trying to identify which sort of technologies to actually integrate into our curriculum. <coughs> there's social networking technologies, there's blogs, wikis, clickers, Twitter, all sorts of technologies that we have to think about in terms of, well first we need to learn about them, then we need to actually identify which ones to use in our curriculum. And there's a lot of options to choose from which again can be overwhelming and hard to uh, determine, especially when we're busy teaching and researching and our busy active lives. So a little bit of background. The study that we did at UNSW builds on a previous um, OLT, ALTC um, funded project that was conducted by Macquarie University in 2009-2010 alongside Western University of Western Sydney and the University of Technology Sydney. That study uh, was looking at students' IT preferences, um, particularly at those universities, and did a multi-university study in 2010 in terms of a survey to see what sort of technologies they're using for their personal lives, their educational experience, and what they would want more of. We decided to do a similar study. Um, we, we talked to those who did the study back in um, 2010 and they were willing to share the results with us and they were willing to share their survey instruments with us so that we could do a similar study to see what sort of changes might have happened since 2010. So what has really changed in our society since 2010? Well, we had the introduction of this device. And we all know this device. And it was April 2010 when it was first announced seems like it was always part of our lives, but it was only three years ago. Um, but it's, it's been around. So I just came across the Telstra smartphone index that came out just a couple months ago. And I thought the results from that were quite interesting. 72% of mobile phone usage in Australia uh, in 2013 is the use of smartphones. Not particularly surprising. That's double from 2010. So introduction of the iPad more smartphone usage, and particularly amongst our young Australians, 16 to 24 years, they're spending equivalent of 29 days a year on their smartphone. So they're walking down the street looking at it, they're on the bus looking at it, wherever they are, they're on their smartphone. That's a lot of time. So we had a video competition at UNSW just recently for our students to think about how they use technology in their learning experiences. And I thought I'd share this very short video with you, just to give you a little bit of a, a taster. Give me a moment.
So, definitely a lot of mobile usage. The idea of learning anywhere, anytime. They're on their iPads, accessing the learning management system. They also have their laptop open at the same time. Oftentimes, they also have their mobile device, their phone, right next to them as well. So a lot of technology is going on around the same time, and they're multitasking between different activities that they're doing. So what did we do? We uh, conducted our survey in August of this year. It was open to all students at University of New South Wales, undergraduate and postgrad. So the distribution that we had in terms of the different year levels, fairly, fairly uh, consistent, except for not so many in the final year. They weren't very interested in doing our survey, perhaps. They were ready to leave the university and never talk to us. Um, but that's what we did. And we wanted to know where they were accessing their course material from. So in line of this recent uh, three years, we've had the iPad and mobile devices. So we compared our study um, with the previous study that I mentioned. The blue is the 2010 study, <coughs> the red is 2013. And that's where our mobile usage is sitting. So it's doubled, very consistent with the smartphone index results. Um, they're accessing about the same at home, not much of a difference, of course. Very much of their usage of course content is happening at home. A little bit more on campus, actually. Maybe that's because wireless has become much better on campus. We don't quite know. Um, but definitely there's an increase, and a growing increase, with our mobile. And what technologies do students actually want more use of? So I, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of technologies to choose from. It can be very overwhelming to select them, so we wanted to know what are they actually asking for. So these are the types of technologies we explored in the survey. Um, learning technologies in particular, grade books, assignment drop boxes, blogs, social networking technologies, e-journals, to see what they were actually asking for. So we compared, um, this is the 2013 study only, we compared the educational versus the everyday versus what the students actually want. So internet searches on the left hand side has been, it's being used a lot, that's the Google search engine, Yahoo, we know that's being used a lot. But as the green bar, the lower one here indicates, they actually want more use of that. So a lot of the times we're asking them to go online and search for things. They're probably getting tired of that. They want something else. Podcasts and videos, and that could be the YouTube videos. They, exp they look at the funny videos and their everyday use, perhaps. But also the videos for educational purposes, the lecture videos, the Echo 360, the Lectopia videos, as well as any other podcasts um, in their courses. So it's not being used all that much, but they definitely want more of it. So that's something to consider. And the social networking is a particularly interesting one, because we all know that they're on Facebook a lot of the time. But the question a lot of um, educators ask me, and I hear them talking about, is if our students are using Facebook, do we need to be there as well? Do we need to be setting up Facebook pages for our courses? Um, they're there, so do we need to be there as the teacher as well? And it's a mixed response on that one. Um, we can see here they want more use of social networking, but we really need to explore what they mean by that. A lot of the times, the students are going on Facebook and creating their own course pages. And they're using that themselves. They don't necessarily want their teachers to be there. They want a space where they can ask questions of one another, share resources, talk about when the due date is of the assignment. They don't necessarily want us to be there alongside them. And they're setting up those pages themselves, um, and they're organizing them themselves, and they're having a great place to be able to collaborate online, when they're at home, while they're studying, they need an immediate response, and they're, and they're on it. So a lot of times when you, when you see our kids on Facebook, we're thinking they're just socializing, we really want them to be studying. In fact, most of the time they are. Um, they're they're communicating with one another. It's just the new way of communication, as it seems. So that's that. So we wanted to compare it with 2010, three years ago. It doesn't seem all that long, um, yet it has been quite a while. And the various types of technologies. So this was the 2010 results of that survey. Internet search, no, not really surprising, being used quite a lot. The other technologies, not so much, back in 2010. And here's 2013. When I look at that, I don't see a whole lot of difference. 
gone up a little bit, a little bit of growth, but not as much as we would have expected. With the use of mobiles, with new technologies, more readily accessible um, workshops that are provided, training that's provided, encouragement, there's all this um, talk in higher education institutions in particular around blended learning, flexible learning, the use of technology. Well, this is really how it's being used. So, some has even dropped a little bit, it seems, a little bit, the assignment drop box. Um, but the others, not so much. But what do the students actually want? And that's what the students want. Everything. Except the internet search engine. So, maybe we don't need to mention Google and Yahoo. They're going there already. Um, but everything else, they want more of it. And a lot more of it. Um, but take a look at what's actually down here. So the online grade book, it's an efficient tool. You can put your grades there. Students get their grades. It's individualized. Assignment drop boxes. That's a huge difference <coughs> of what they're actually using and what they want more of. They want to be able to submit their assignments online. It's easier for us as teachers. We don't have to be worried about <coughs> spilling coffee on it, leaving it somewhere, not bringing it to class. It's a lot easier. It's all online. They can get their feedback online. This is quite huge. Just over 10% are really using and providing online feedback. And what that really means is just returning the submissions with a little bit of feedback. So our <coughs> students are always asking us for more feedback. We have course evaluation surveys at UNSW. Consistently, feedback seems to be the one thing that we're lacking. So they want more of it. Now, I don't know at what point we'll stop asking for more but they definitely want more of it. So if we can make it easier for ourselves to provide that feedback, then we can start to meet some of their needs. It's all about making our lives more efficient. A lot of these technologies are all about efficiency. Not so much about a lot of innovation. It's not about changing everything all at once. Little bit by little bit, we can start to, you know, maybe have a discussion forum, maybe have a <coughs> Q&A, so instead of them emailing us, they can post the discussion forum, Oftentimes, they'll respond to one another before you have time to respond, and that's great. You can check in, make sure that the response is actually correct, and, um, or if it's not, or if they haven't gone to respond to one another, at least you only have to respond once instead of via email or um, lots of lineups at the door. <coughs> so that's the one that's <coughs> not so much. So how can we address their needs? That's the big question. They want a lot of technologies, and there's a lot out there. So last year I did a slightly different study. I was very interested. One of my doctoral, my major doctoral study was looking at what sort of factors actually influence um, teachers to adopt technology. How can we start to identify what those factors really are so we can start addressing and so we can increase our technology usage. So I asked um, lecturers, at, this is at the University of British Columbia, I asked the lecturers, um, a small group of them, what and how they're thinking about using technology. What is influencing their use of technology? How do they make those decisions of when to use it or what to use? And these are just three particular quotes that I found of uh, most interest. Just let you read that for a moment. So, it feeds along to what we've been talking about, shared office spaces. They happen to be in the shared office space, and they, talk, they have more of an opportunity to speak with one another. They might say, oh, by the way, I'm posting my grades on my uh, online grade book. And the other one may say, well, what is that? Tell me more about that. It allows for more of an opportunity um, to communicate. Some are just not technology inclined, and that's fine. Um, but they seem to get their expertise and find interesting people outside of the department. So what I was interested in exploring was whether those conversations were happening within their office space, within their school, external to their school, where are they having those technology related, specifically educational technology related conversations. And then some get together regularly, especially if they're teaching the same course, and we're talking about collaboration earlier th today. Collaboration, working together to develop a course, allows for more opportunity for them to share those ideas 
meeting at the beginning of the semester to talk about which technologies to try out this year. Maybe halfway through the semester to see what's been working and after the semester to see what sort of changes they want to make. So it's those informal and formal conversations that really came through from that study that I did in terms of it really influencing their technology related decisions. Some are having those conversations in informal places, um, in the hallways, in, a, in an office space. Some are having the more informal places within school meetings where they actually set aside a time to talk about technology. Not all school meetings have time to talk about technology. There's lots of other things to talk about. There's general, it's all about those conversations, those networks that they're making with one another. So as educational institutions, we need to provide opportunities for them to have these conversations. Um, informal ones in particular, shared office spaces perhaps, e-learning showcases where those who might be more technology advanced can share what they're doing with others, have some conversations afterwards, um, opportunities for them to go to conferences and have those networking conversations, and formal conversations. Regular set up meetings between those who can be in the same course, mentorship opportunities perhaps for those who are more technology um, advanced, helping those who might not be using technology as much, communities of practice so that they can all have an opportunity to come together. Now they're busy, that's one of the challenges of communities of practice is being able to find a time um, and a day where everybody can come together to have those conversations and that's where we can start exploring some of the online technologies that we have. Um, resources that they can access online, networking and conversations they can have online if they're not able to actually physically be together in the same space. But of course, these on the right hand side are still also being accessed. One of the lecturers I spoke to actually said, I don't want to speak to any of my colleagues about technology. I want to go to the expert. I want to speak to the expert, get my answer right away, and that's all. So that's the educational technology support that person was seeking. Not all of them want that but some are still asking for that. Some are going to workshops, some are not. And of course, if we can try to get them to access the online resources, it's always a challenge when we spend a lot of money making online resources and it's not accessed. So we have to be careful around that. Making it useful, short, exactly what they want, easy to access. So that's generally what those are all about. What we're planning to do with our study, we did this in August, is to run it again um, this coming semester. Um, hopefully have more people um, respond to our survey, see what the results are like uh, this time round, and to also start exploring what's, how students are actually using the technology. So while this study is really about the responses that the students are giving, students are saying, this is what we're using, this is what we want more of, because of all the usage of the online technologies, we can start exploring that sort of data as well. So what technologies are the uh, teachers actually implementing in their classes? The, the teachers might be implementing it, but the students might not actually be accessing it. So we need to start exploring, if, is there a connection between that? Helping our teachers to access some of that data so they can make their informed decisions. If they put out a discussion forum, they put a technology use, but are the students actually accessing that? So that's kind of the area of learning analytics that I'm not going to get into too much today, but it allows for an opportunity to start looking at that objective data alongside some of this student data coming through the surveys. And I'm happy to take any questions before we go off for some tea or coffee. It may be that the, um, the teachers aren't integrating it as much. So with the assignment drop-offs in particular, it just might be that it's not being used in terms of the teachers not putting it integrated. Because usually with the assignment drop-off, you'll ask them to submit it online, and they, and they would. Um, but yeah, that is an interesting one. And it's interesting, you've got blogs there. We've worked out that they were reporting 19-year-olds don't use blogs, but the group behind them are. So that's, that's going to be a growing one, yeah. absolutely. Mm. It's, a, it's, it's the one to watch, actually, especially around the use of reflective practice yes. becoming more integrated into the curriculum. The blogs is an interesting space to watch. It's, and they want more of it. Yes? 
So this isn't entirely against the student-driven education. It's actually what we're trying to do is get a feel of what students want more of so we can start addressing some of their needs. Um, the survey was mostly asking, it was a student survey, so we were asking the students what technologies are they using in their everyday life and what technologies are they using in their educational experience to get a sense of that um, and what they want more of. Now, a lot of what they use in their educational experience is due to what the teachers integrate into their curriculum. So if we're trying to encourage our teaching staff to use various types of technologies that institutions are trying to implement, we need to help them determine which technologies to use, help them explore the idea of what students are asking for so they can start meeting their needs. So in that sense, it's still student-driven. Yes? What was the target group of the students here? Were they university students? Were they school students? Was it a, a broad range? University students. Uh, university. Yes. yes. I would say a lot of that is helping us manage our time, making it more efficient. Um, the videos, you know, the podcast, if they can't come to class, they can access the video, submitting it online so they don't have to come in to, to submit it. Um, there's all sorts of very, it's all about time efficiency, both for the students, but even more so for the teachers. the challenge that the institutions have. So there hasn't been much of an, of an increase, which means that just by providing the technology doesn't mean the teachers are going to use it, doesn't mean they're going to grasp it or use it effectively. Um, there's the idea around blended learning and the idea that, for instance, if a university or a higher education institution has a learning management system, they want their lecturers to use it. And they think that just by providing their course outline on the LMS, they've met that goal. So it's a huge challenge, and I've seen this across many universities here and when I was in Canada, that the number one way that they're using online technologies is plotting information, course outlines, um, course notes, PowerPoint files, decimation, giving information, not much change in our learning approaches, not much change in our teaching approach. It's exactly the same as when they lecture and they provide information. It's actually just duplicating it, really. They're giving themselves more work. 
So it's showing that we need to start identifying ways that we can reach out to our teachers, can't just provide the technology and expect them to start using it and know how to use it effectively. We have to find ways to explore how to actually get them to think about using it and using it in the right way, um, which is what my earlier study was trying to do, was to identify what those factors actually are. Um, the conversations, you know, like you said, we don't have time to go to our own workshops. We don't have time to, um, to do that or even go online and look at resources because it's so overwhelming. You go to one site and it's all sorts of various technologies. Where do I even start? I don't have time to start. So we need to identify what those factors are, whether it's the conversations, whether it's making it more efficient um, in order to be able to meet the goals that our institutions are trying to set. Challenge. I think there was a question before. Yeah. There was just uh, this one. Yeah, we can share that. Absolutely. We're also in the in the process of um, trying to publish some of this data as well. Another question. No, not at all. No. No. What students want more of is efficient use of their time. So if it's information that the teachers are providing, you, we can have them access that information on their own time, at home, on the train, but they want to come together and talk with one another. So those discussions, those critical discussions, that collaboration that we're talking about, there needs to be a space for that. You could do that online, but why not do that right in the classroom? And that's the whole idea of flipping the, the learning experience. All that information push can be done online, while the face-to-face -face time is so important for them to develop their social skills in particular, develop the idea of working with one another. Yeah.